Roshit, Rabbi Lord Sachs, Dain Bizdok, Rabbi Nim, Sue and, and Leo Noe, and all your family that are here. It's a great pleasure to take part in such an illustrious evening, particularly because of the historic nature of the event. I remember as a child, Rabbi Steinzatz staying with us for Shabbat as the original Hebrew Steinzatz translation was still in process. And it was that Shabbat that I realized how privileged I was to be growing up in a generation where Talmud was becoming accessible to the many, where until that point, it had just been the treasure of the few. Tonight's celebration of the complete Noe edition of the Koran Talmud Bavli is another monumental milestone. Musing at how education's evolved and the challenges we face inspiring a new generation to connect to Talmud study, I've picked a sugya that deals with some of these central questions. What kind of an educational system are we striving for? Is it one size fits all? How much should learning be student-led? And how do we deal with those students who are disengaged? In the booklets, we turn to page 10, we pick up in the tractate of Avodah Zarah, which is all about idolatry. And we're in the first chapter. We've just read in the last few pages about idolaters who turned around their lives in one act of goodness. B'sha'achat. They did complete shuva. And now, almost in recognition that it's not the normative model, this isn't the ideal that we aspire to, the Gemara turns to look inward at our own educational system. And so we begin with the statement of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the famous Rabbi Judah, the prince, the compiler of the Mishnah, who is second century living in the land of Israel. And he was a man of tremendous vision, a depth of knowledge, but also a breadth. And that breadth is reflected in his statement. He starts off by talking about the verse which is in the second verse of the first chapter of the book of Psalms. Here we have it. Ki'im b'torat Hashem cheftza. That his delight, a person's delight, is in the Torah of Hashem. But Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi looks at this verse very carefully and he wants to darshan it out in a different way. Amar Rabbi, Rabbi said, and this of course was how Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was known, he was just known as Rabbi. Ein adam lomed Torah, ela mimakom shelibo chafetz. A person can only truly learn when they're motivated. Motivation is at the heart of successful education. Shne'emar, as it says, ki im b'torat Hashem cheftzo, that his desire has to be in the Torah of Hashem, i.e. a person has to really be interested in what they're learning. And now we're taken to Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's classroom. He's there, learning with his youngest son, Rabbi Shimon, and another student, Levi. We're in the second paragraph. Levi for Rabbi Shimon, but Rabbi Yatve Kame de Rabbi, they're sitting there before Rabbi, the Kapiske Sidara, and they finish learning the five books of the Torah. Select Sifra, and they conclude the book that they're learning. So now they need to find a new project. So suggestions come up. Levi Amar, Levi says, Laitu lan mishle, let's learn Proverbs. Rabbi Shimon bar Rabbi Amar, Laitu lan tilim, no, let's learn Psalms. Kafye le Levi v'aitu tilim. So they persuade Levi and they bring out Tehillim to start learning. Of course, you don't have to get very far. It's the first chapter, the second verse, you reach our verse. Kimatu hacham, when they come here, ki im b'torat Hashem chafzo, it's in the Torah of Hashem that he delights. Rabbi gives his commentary, his interpretation. Paresh Rabbi v'amar, ein adam lomed Torah, ela mimakom shelibo chafet. A person has to be motivated to learn Torah. It has to be something that interests them. Amar Levi, so Levi gets up and he says, Rabbi, Thank you very much. You've given me permission to leave. I said I wasn't interested in learning Psalms. Thank you, I'm going. And remarkably, we don't see 
him being reprimanded, that's the end of the episode. Can you imagine if that happened in our classrooms today? And that is really our question. What do we do with the levy in the classroom? What do we do with the levy in the study hall? What do we do with the levy who doesn't have any other book that they'd prefer to study instead? Now we fast forward about a century and a half. We're now in the period of the Amora'im, the sages of the Gemara. By now, the central academies of learning are in Babylon. And we see that not everybody agreed with this very broad approach of Rabbi, that it has to just be about what you're interested in. What happens if somebody's not interested in learning? And so we pick up here in the third paragraph. Amar Rabbi Avdimi Bar Chama. Rabbi Avdimi Bar Chama says, Kol haosek ba Torah, anybody who engages and learns Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Oselo Chafetzav, Hashem will reward him. He will fulfill his desires. Shne'emar ki im b'torat Hashem cheftzo. Quoting our verse, i.e. he reads it totally differently. That the reason that you learn well is not necessarily because you're highly motivated. You might have burning passion one day and you might not have burning passion the next day. That's not why you learn. You learn because it's a religious obligation to learn Torah, to engage with it, and you have the faith that Hashem will reward you. Your own experience is not necessarily as important. However, that contrasts with Rava. And Rava is going to become the protagonist of this part of the Gemara. Amar Rava. Le'olam yilmod adam Torah v'makom shelibo chafet. It seems that Rava is more in line with the thinking of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. And he extends it further. So he says a person has to learn Torah in the place that their heart desires. Not only figuratively the place, but also the, the literal place, the geographical place makes a difference. The classroom environment makes a difference to the learner's experience. The choice of sem or yeshiva makes a difference. And a student has to choose the place that, they, that speaks to them, that they feel drawn towards. That is what is going to create the best best outcomes in learning. Quoting once again from our verse, And as we turn over, this now becomes what I imagine to myself if it would be today, it would sort of be a, a short clip of Rava's life hacks for successful education that a, a list of statements in the name of Rava brought starts off with a mantra and is then followed up by educational protocol. So we look first of all at the mantra that we see before us where Rava essentially looks at education as a process. It's not a fait accompli. So he takes that verse that we've been talking about until now and he says, hang on, we've only seen the beginning part of the verse. Va'ama Rava, and Rava said, If we think about it, what was the description of Torah? It was Torah Hashem. It was ascribed to Hashem. But if we carry on till the end of the verse, It becomes attributed to the learner. Because, how does the verse continue, Shne'emar, as it says, B'Torat Hashem Cheftzo, a person begins learning Torat Hashem, but then as they have a stake in it, Uva Torato Yege Yomam Velayla, it's their Torah, he or she, that person, it becomes their Torah, and that is something they should pursue for the rest of their lives, day and night. I.e., according to Rava, this, this is the dynamism of the learning process where essentially an individual is being invited into a partnership with HaKadosh Baruch Hu when they engage in learning his Torah. He then follows this up with the protocol part. And he has two main premises. His first one is the importance of having a broad base of general knowledge first. Looking at an entire topic and only then going into greater analysis and depth. Even if it means that a person is learning and they don't totally understand everything. They've got a lot of questions as they're going through a chapter. He says, still, you should have a sweep of the broad topic and only when you get to the end of that, go back and look at it in depth. His second principle is that rather than learning, trying to amass a vast amount of knowledge, what he calls chavilot chavilot, getting bundles of knowledge, that's self-defeating 
because that kind of cramming in is going to be very hard to retain. Whereas when a person learns kovet saliad, little by little, and each time they consolidate their learning, that is something that hopefully will remain with them for their life. Now, interestingly, it seems that this second point was the more contentious, and it's the first time that we see a schism between the theory and the practice. So Rava laments the fact that he says, the sages agree with me that this is the right way to learn, and yet they're not following it in practice. And he also waits for Dimi. Dimi was the sage who was characterized that he would bring the messages from the sages in Eretz Yisrael and what their teachings were back to the academies in Babylon. And he waits for Dimi to come to bring a message from Eretz Yisrael that they too believe that this is the most effective way to learn. What's fascinating about this whole backwards and forwards, and each time, Rav, as we already saw at the end of, of the last piece of Gemara from Dian Binstock, is the way that Rav very artistically plays with verses, each time taking particular words and darshaning them out and backing his protocol up with these verses. And he plays with this at length. But what's really interesting is that Every verse is very carefully handpicked, either from Psalms or from Proverbs. Those two books that were debated between Shimon and Levi. I.e., in a very subtle way, Rava is driving home Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's point that whether it's a Shimon or a Levi, there has to and there can be a meaningful educational experience for everyone. The final part of this piece of Talmud, we're now turning to page 13, towards the end. If you look at the final paragraph, the third line from the bottom in the English, it says, Rabbi Tanchum. And in the Hebrew, it's the penultimate line after the dash. We see once again an evolution. It's going to be a big change from that very broad statement of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. A person should always split their life, the years of their life, into three. Shlish b'mikra, a third in Bible. Shlish b'mishnah, shlish b'talmud. A third should be dedicated to Mishnah. A third should be dedicated to Talmud. And when you turn over, the Gemara questions this and says, Well, who knows how long they're going to live? As mortal beings, we don't know our lifespan, so therefore, how can you divide your life into three parts? And the answer is, kikam rinan biyame. Rather, this is talking about splitting up your daily life, that they contain these three elements of learning, so that when it comes to the end of your life, you could basically average it out that it works out a third, a third, a third. If anybody is wondering why, if you look at yeshivot, they don't have a third, a third, a third. It's pretty much all Talmud study. It's actually because Rabbeinu Tam over here said, actually, when you learn Talmud, you're incorporating all three of them. The Tosfot disagree and say, no, it's a more uh, conventional reading of actually a third, a third, a third. But be that as it may, what we clearly see is that this has moved quite a long way from that just learn what the student wants to learn, where Rashi says it's as much that when a teacher's ready to start a new topic, they should say to their student, what do you want to learn? In Talmud, he's, he, he specifically says, this, the Rebbe should say to the student, what masechet do you want to learn next? And yet we've now come to a prescriptive curriculum, a third, a third, a third. And of course, of this whole conversation, which part is codified in the halakha? The last part, the very last part. But actually, we see how it's really drawing these various components together. We see similar tensions in the tractate of Horayot. Here, it's the same qualities being debated, but this time it's with a view to leadership. Which leader should be appointed? Is it the one who's expert in one topic or somebody who has a broad knowledge like Rava ad advocated? And so on page, the continuation of page 14, we see in the section of Harayot, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, 
Pligubar Rabban Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel for Rabbanan. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel had a dispute with the sages in terms of which type of learning is better. Chadamar, one of them said, Sinai Adif, a Sinai thinker is better. It's very interesting imagery that's used here. The Sinai thinker is named such because they have a broad encyclopedic knowledge, a vast knowledge that they can remember all the topics that were given to us at Sinai. But the other one says, actually, that's not what we should be looking for in a leader. Chadamar oker harim adif. We should be looking for somebody who uproots mountains, somebody who takes one topic and they can pull it apart and they can pull it up and look underneath it and analyze it and ask brilliant questions. That's the kind of leader we should be looking for. Now, this isn't just about theory. This is also was a reality in terms of the leaders they had at the time. Rav Yosef, Sinai. Rav Yosef was a Sinai thinker. And by the way, it's not surprising. Guess whose son he was? Rava, who advocated this broad thinking. Rabba Oker Harim. But Rabba was a, an Oker Harim thinker, an uprooter of mountains, very sharp. Shalchul and they send a message to Eretz Yisrael. Eze Mehem Kodem. Which one should, we, should be the leader? Shalchul they send back a message to Babel, to Babylon. Sinai Adif, the Sinai thinker is better. The Amar Mar Hakol Tzrichin Lemare Chitaya. They send a cryptic code, so to speak, saying everybody needs a master of the wheat. Meaning, I guess in today's terminology, you would say it's bread and butter. The Sinai thinker, he knows all the things about all the various elements we need. It's the bread and butter, and that is the most essential. And yet, Vafilu Hachi Lokabel Rav Yosef Ale. Rav Yosef didn't accept the leadership upon himself, but rather, Malach Rabba Esrin Vitarteshnin, Rabba reigned for 22 years, Vahadar Malach Rav Yosef, and only after that did Rav Yosef assume leadership. Now, when we turn over the page, you'll see that another dilemma, a very similar dilemma, comes up with two other leaders. Ibayalahu. Once again, there's a dilemma. Rabbi Zeira, the Rabba Bar Rav Matana, two great thinkers. Haiminayo Adif, which one is preferable? Rabbi Zeira Kharifu Maksha. Rabbi Zeira was so sharp. The questions he asked were extraordinary. The Rabba Bar Rav Matana, but Rabba, he was matun umasik. He was much more moderate, but yet he always seemed to come to the right conclusions. My, so which one should we appoint? Teku. This is the very last word of the entire tractate of Horayot, and it ends with a teku. It's unresolved. That's what we're left with. It's unresolved. We're left on the cliffhanger. And yet, in a sense, it takes us back full circle. It underlies that dynamic process of education. Times change. The needs of the leader change. No static answer would suffice for us reading this passage thousands of years later. We need to see the qualities of both, the underpinning values that are required in education, and then apply them based on the situation that we face. So now pulling all of this together on this special evening, three, here are three reflections. First of all, in each story, despite the excellent yeshivot in Babylon, they sought the advice of Torah Eretz Yisrael. For me, learning and teaching from the Noe edition of the current Talmud Bavli these last few years, one feels a real infusion of Torah Eretz Yisrael. The inspirational story of Eliyahu Koren leaving Germany in 1933 with the best qualifications as a graphic designer from Nuremberg and coming to Eretz Yisrael and dedicating those talents to publishing a Tanakh that hadn't been published by the Jewish community for 500 years in its entirety with its own font, the Koran font, triggered a revival in the learning of Tanakh. And Koran, under Matthew Miller's leadership, continue to exude Torah Eretz Yisrael through their publications all around the world. And that revival has now extended in a magical way to Talmud study. Secondly, in looking at just a few excerpts here, we've jumped centuries, countries, study halls, tapping into the vigorous debate that there was, was their hallmark. The philosopher Bernard-Henri Levy 
in his fascinating work, The Genius of Judaism, eventually concludes that the genius of Judaism is the Talmud, the book and the books. He says it's when one chooses to close the book, to comment on them no further, to challenge and oppose them no more, that the genius dies. Tonight, we celebrate the perpetuation of that debate. And thirdly, with regards to education, my grandfather, Rabbi Morris Lou, Zichrono Livracha, spoke of two sacred triangles that come together to form the Magen David. On the individual level, you have the child, the parent, and the teacher. And on the institutional level, you have the school, the shul, and the home. Interestingly, the shield is not two triangles, one perfectly aligned on top of the other, but rather, they slap together. Just as the Gemara recognized, the system and the individual are not always aligned. But when there's respect that there needs to be a robust educational system with protocol, but also the acknowledgement and flexibility for different personalities and differing styles, together they form the Magen David. So in conclusion, take you. There is no one way as long as the Shimons and the Levies, and of course, the Saras and the Dinas, have access to an empowering, dynamic process of education, then with inspirational leadership and the help of heaven with Siyata Dishmaya, Na Sevenat Sliach. <laughs>